Thank you, Josh, uh, for reading our passage. Um, before I get into this, I will make one more announcement that uh, came to me by email yesterday concerning the Easter conference in April, April 7th and 8th. I've been asked to get numbers for people who plan to attend on either or both days so that I can send that information on to them and they can plan um, the hall for the seating and, and things like that. So uh, if you're planning to go to the Easter conference on the Friday, which is April 7th, or the Saturday, April 8th, or both days, uh, please just let me know either in person or a quick email just so I can uh, get some numbers to Mr. McCann uh, for the planning for that. Paul's letter to Philemon. Uh, trying to think of a title for this, I thought of maybe short letter, long message. Um, it is a short letter. Uh, it's only 25 verses long, but don't let its brief nature lead you into thinking that it's not an important book in the Bible. This is the Word of God uh, passed on through Paul, and it's, it's in the Bible for, for a very uh, specific reason. But it's also a very unique book, uh, especially compared to the other letters of Paul, uh, in that it doesn't directly introduce any new doctrine or instructive teaching, but rather it is filled with illustrations of Christian doctrine being lived out. Very little is known about the man Philemon. In fact, this letter is the only direct source of information we have for him. Uh, verses four through seven, which we'll look at in, uh, in just a few moments, speak of his good character, and some of the other events found in the book, we can, through them, we can understand that Philemon was possibly well off financially. Uh, he lived in or near the city of Colossae, uh, which we know more of from Paul's letter to the church there, uh, the book of Colossians. What's interesting that I find about Paul's relationship to the church, the city of Colossians and Philemon, is that we really have no record of Paul ever physically visiting the city of Colossae. Uh, Acts tells us that he traveled throughout the countryside, going from place to place uh, in the regions of Galatia and Phrygia, which is uh, where Colossae was located. However, in the letter of Colossians, uh, Paul writes in, in chapter 2 that he wanted them to know the struggles he had for the church there and in Laodicea nearby and for all those who had not seen him face to face. So we can understand from putting this all together that it is quite possible, not, uh, not impossible, but it is quite possible that Paul never visited the city of Colossae in person. Uh, during this time, if we read Acts chapter 19, it tells us that Paul spoke daily uh, from Ephesus uh, in the hall of Tyrannus, and that as a result of that, all the residents of Asia, where Colossae is located, heard the word of the Lord. And so what it seems is that two things were happening during this time. One, people from the surrounding areas were coming to Ephesus to hear Paul speak. And I think we can relate to that when, uh, even in our, in our own region, when there's a, a speaker who's well known for his handling of the word of God, we tend, we tend to go, we tend to travel to hear them speak. And so that was evident that that was happening with Paul in Ephesus. People were traveling there. And the other thing is that people were going out from Ephesus to carry the gospel to the other parts of the Roman province. From all this, um, again, though Paul had possibly never visited the church at Colossae, he would have met some of them in person as they traveled through Ephesus and he would have known others by reputation. And we see that in, in several of his letters where he talks about having heard of someone's conduct or someone's faith. Uh, we, we see that especially of some of the churches that he wrote to. And that's uh, a quite common greeting from Paul, is that I thank God always for I've heard of your faith and how your faith is spreading throughout the different region. Getting back to Philemon, uh, when we hear Paul's, or when we read a, Paul's acknowledgement of his character, uh, the language could seem that it was all by reputation or that he had heard about these things or rather than experienced them himself. Uh, but that said, towards the end of the letter, we have that curious statement where Paul says, not to mention that you owe to me even yourself as well. And when we read that, the, the most strongest, uh, the strongest interpretation of that is that 
Philemon came to be a believer under Paul's ministry. Um, so whether uh, Philemon traveled to Ephesus or they met at some other times, it, it, it does seem that, that Philemon came to be a believer uh, sitting under Paul, and it's very likely that they had a very personal relationship beyond just knowing who the other one was. And I think that is evidenced in the personal nature of this letter that's given, uh, that's sent to Philemon. Uh, as mentioned, it's not a letter that was intended to impart a teaching, uh, but it was a request. He's sending a request to live out and to practice things that would have already been taught. The occasion for this letter was a man, a slave, named Onesimus. Paul's letter to Philemon is extremely personal in parts. And it reads, uh, as we read through this, it's, it reads almost as much as a narrative as it does a letter. We can follow the story throughout and, and see the things that are going on. And so even though no new instruction is given, we can learn so much from the, from the way that Paul expresses his heart towards his friend. And in several ways, we can see the love of Christ being lived out through those that follow him. So let's begin by taking a closer look at Philemon and his family. Paul opens the letter, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace, and peace, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes it seems that there are portions of the scripture that are uh, kind of easier just to quickly skim through on our way to the good parts. Um, often Paul's introductions to his letters can fit into that category, and I would encourage you not to, not to do that, but to, to really spend time on them to really dig deeper into them, uh, because there is a lot that we can draw from this. Uh, most of Paul's introductions in his letters are quite similar. He identifies himself, he identifies who the letter is addressed to, and then gives what appears to be a, a fairly standard greeting of grace and peace uh, to the reader, or some, some variation of that. There are a couple exceptions, notably the letter to Romans, where a bit more detail is, is given in uh, before the addressee is given. But again, as direct as the greeting may seem, there's a lot under the surface that can help in understanding the closeness of this relationship uh, that Paul has and that, uh, that the recipients of this letter has. In verse 1, Paul identifies himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus and also indicates that Timothy was with him. So this, first of all, allows us to let us figure out sort of around the time that the book was written. Uh, we believe it was written uh, during Paul's first imprisonment, his house arrest, uh, while he was in Rome. But it's also worth noting the lack of credentials that Paul gives. Uh, of the 13 letters that we know were written by Paul, only three of them don't reference Paul's apostolic authority. Philemon, 2 Thessalonians, and Philippians. Now, for 2 Thessalonians, Paul actually mentions his apostolic authority in 1 Thessalonians. And so we can understand that, that they would have carried over and, and known uh, and remembered that. As for Philippians, uh, that makes a lot of sense, too, because one of the primary themes of the letter to Philippians was uh, about valuing Christ over all of our earthly titles and status and, and possession, making him have the preeminence. So, so to dial back and, and send that just as a follower of Christ rather than as apostle of Christ makes sense because it further glorifies the Lord Jesus. The other letters uh, that were addressed to individuals that we have in scripture, Timothy and Titus, Again, Paul uses that statement that he was Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. But with Philemon, he was going to be making a very personal request to him, a very deep request. And, uh, you know, we can imagine uh, that there will, there will be times when a person must speak with his authority, that they must stand on what authority they have and, and, and speak from that. But there are times... Uh, 
that people need to lay that authority aside and speak as a friend, speak as a family member. Imagine uh, the President of the United States, whoever it happens to be at any given time, commanding his friends and family to come to his barbecue because he is the President after all. Um, of course, this is an absurd example, but it, it, it helps to stress that idea that al although Paul was an apostle, and although he could use that authority in this request that he's making, there are times, and this is one of them, that he would lay that authority aside for the purpose of intimate communication with his friends. And that's what's, that's what's happening here. We'll look, we'll look a little bit more at that in, in just a few moments when we get to that portion, but I want to look at the people that the letter was addressed to. Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus. There's also mention of the church in their house as well. Just how, um, uh, again, not much known outside of this letter from Philemon, but the same can be said of Aphia. Uh, this is the only mention that we have of her here, but uh, we do have some information that we can pull from this. Aphia is a feminine name uh, in the Greek. And so it's most widely assumed, and many biblical scholars agree on this, and that's usually something when you see them agreeing, uh, that Aphia was Philemon's wife. And more than that, uh, look how they're introduced to us. Philemon, uh, a beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister uh, in Christ. So what we can pull from this is that Philemon and Aphia were both believers. Uh, makes sense. That's often who Paul wrote his letters to. Uh, the nature of the term used for Philemon, this fellow worker, is open, and it, it, it could include someone that, uh, who taught or spread the word of God, um, but it could also indicate someone who provided practical uh, help, uh, practical assistance, even financial assistance, maybe even to Paul and the other evangelists of the day. One thing is abundantly clear, though, again, is that both of these people were believers. Uh, the third individual mentioned is Archippus. He's described as a fellow soldier, uh, which indicates, again, that he was a believer and that most likely he was involved in the evangelistic work of spreading the gospel. Uh, a fellow soldier, another, another member of the fight uh, to get the gospel known, to get it out there. Now, Archippus is also mentioned in the book of Colossians, where Paul writes a portion specifically to tell him, to tell Archippus to fulfill the ministry that he has received from the Lord. Now, the letter to the church at Colossae was written at the same time as the letter to Philemon. Uh, in the fourth chapter of Colossians, we see that Paul sent a man named Tychicus, along with a man named Onesimus, who is part of the subject of this letter, to deliver the letter to Colossians and then to deliver this letter, along with Onesimus, to Philemon. Uh, it's believed also that Tychicus on the way delivered the letter to the Ephesians and that those letters were supposed to be shared among the churches. Uh, I mention this because it does put separation between this letter uh, and the letter to Philemon and the one to the, the, and to the letter to Philemon. After Archippus is mentioned, the letter to Philemon also adds the addressee to the church in your house. Now, there's some conversation about what this means. We know that it isn't a reference to the full church at Colossae. Um, if it had meant the full church at Colossae, this letter would have been redundant. He could have just included all of this in that one. Uh, it's either a reference to a smaller gathering of believers that met at the home of Philemon, uh, or, and I believe this is, this is the case more so, that there were several others that were part of Philemon's household, other children, servants, uh, who had come to faith in Christ also. And, uh, and I believe that that is the case because of Archippus being mentioned in both letters as part of the church at Colossae and part of the church that gathered at Philemon's house. To me, this presents a wonderful thought to consider about the church. Simply this, a believing family is, in a way, a church unto themselves. Uh, not that we're separate, not that we're separated or isolated from the larger gathering of believers. Uh, we're not. Uh, but while we keep to different roles and responsibilities that come with our position in the household, we also recognize fully that we are fully equal with one another in God's eyes. Uh, you may be a father, 
of a believing child. And you have a, a, a role and authority over that child, but in the eyes of God, God, you're fully equal as believers. And we'll see this displayed in further detail uh, a little later on when we examine Paul's request to Philemon concerning Onesimus, but this can also cause us to look at how the church is to function. If a family of believers is, is like uh, a church unto itself in a way, and we look at what the function of the church is to edify and build one another up, to encourage each other to do good works, and most importantly, to show genuine love for one another. Look around you right now. We are a church. But you know what? We're also a family. Uh, now, it would be wonderful if every biological family on earth operated and worked on this premise of love, care, and unity. Uh, we know that's not the reality uh, all the time. Uh, but that's why this part of the letter is so important, as it serves as a reminder to us of what a family should look like, and in a way, our responsibility to help it look that way as believers in Christ. And, and really, in many ways, a Christian home should resemble a church. Uh, a church should resemble a Christian home. Here are the first two verses uh, from a hymn, number 662 in our red hymnal. Listen to this and, and see how it can apply to both a family and a church. Oh, give us homes built firm upon the Savior, where Christ is head and counselor and guide, where every child is taught his love and favor, and give his heart to Christ the crucified. How sweet to know that though his footsteps waver, his faithful Lord is walking by his side. Oh, give us homes with godly fathers, mothers, who always place their hope and trust in him, whose tender patience turmoil never bothers, whose calm and courage trouble cannot dim. A home where each finds joy in serving others, and love still shines though days be dark and grim. Now, I will admit uh, that I am coming to this uh, thought on the basis presented in Philemon that the whole family uh, and a large part of the entire household are believers living faithfully. Um, but I'll pause that for a moment as we apply this to our own lives, is that what if we are the only believer in our household? What if we uh, are parents of unbelieving children or children of unbelieving parents? The answer is the same. Treat everyone in the family with love, encouragement, and grace. As believers, we have such a great privilege and responsibility to show Christ to those around us, not just by the words we say, and we, and we need to say them, but by the way we live, and often, most impactfully, by the way we treat those around us. Now, again, the opposite of this principle applies, too, that a functioning church should resemble a loving family. As a believer in Christ who belongs to a local gathering of believers or, or a local church, we are part of a family. We are not like a family. We are a family. God in heaven is our Father. And through our faith in Jesus Christ, we are all brothers and sisters in the faith. And, you know, maybe we don't have a, a biological family that uh, is filled with love and care for one another. And that's, uh, that's all the more reason for us to create a healthy, vibrant church uh, so that those people with those families have a place where they can experience what God intended a family to be like. When we think of the gospel, what Jesus did to save us, we, we sometimes focus on the fact that all have sinned and therefore are both separated from God and destined to, to suffer his judgment on our sin. And that, that is an important part of the gospel. We, we have to realize that. And we have to realize that, that thankfully Jesus came and he took that judgment for us by dying on the cross. And that through faith in him, we are saved from our sin. But as much as we are forgiven and saved from uh, the penalty of our sin... We are saved into the family of God. And that's an immense blessing when we stop and consider it. Galatians 4, 7 tells believers that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. 
The book of Romans adds to this idea of being, by, by mentioning being joint heirs with Christ. Essentially, everything that belongs to God belongs to Christ, and through faith in him, also belongs to those who believe in Christ. And we, we looked a little bit about that in our first meeting. It was mentioned about that presence, that being in his glory and enjoying everything uh, that he has to enjoy. This includes eternal life. It includes a home in heaven. And it includes the never-ending love of the Father. This perfect family atmosphere is supposed to be present in the church. Now, we know that's not always the case uh, because we are human. Uh, that's why we need these little books like Philemon to remind us of what things should be like. And if they're not, to encourage us to do everything we can to help it get there. As we move on past the introduction, we get to know Philemon a little better. Paul writes, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because, of the, heart, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So before we get into all of these uh, nice things that uh, are said about Philemon, it's important to note that these are not just empty platitudes or flattery. Uh, it is common for Paul to begin his letters by mentioning that he is thankful uh, for those that he is writing to. Often he is thankful for their faith, that they are believers in Christ. Sometimes he adds that uh, their faith is abundant. This is by no means formulaic. It is purposeful and it is meaningful. Paul is speaking the truth about the people that he is writing to. In Philemon's case, Paul does mention his faith in Christ and also his love for all the saints, for, those, uh, for all those who share that faith in Jesus. There's a good practice here. Paul is encouraging Philemon. And, and it makes me wonder to myself, how good am I at, at doing this for others? Uh, often people can be quick to offer up criticism or point out flaws in, in another. Uh, but it seems less common for, for people to give encouraging words to someone. The important thing to remember with this, though, is that if we are going to compliment someone... We have to be truthful. They can't be empty flatteries. Romans 12, 9 instructs us that our love must be genuine. It must be sincere. Now, we know that there are people in our lives, maybe even in our church family, uh, that we might find difficult to get along with. Um, perhaps we feel they have an abrasive personality. Perhaps we have an abrasive personality. Uh, or we have nothing in common on a personal level. Maybe we just find them a little odd. Building others up in this way that's shown and demonstrated by Paul uh, is, is beautiful because it forces us to look beyond what humanity sees. It, looks us to, it forces us to look beyond what we see with our eyes and into what God sees. Further than that, and this goes back to our, our previous thought, it helps us to remember that they are family to us. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as they are encouraged and strengthened in the Lord, so is our family, so is our church. And the stronger our church is, the more glory we can bring to our Heavenly Father. Are we going out of our way to show kindness to one another, to see the good in every believer, and to point it out? Philemon's strong faith is called out by Paul. In verse 6, it becomes clear that not only did Philemon trust in Christ, but he lived out his faith in front of others. Uh, in the context this was written, it speaks primarily of uh, the practical ways that he helped those around him, both uh, within and, and probably even outside of the church. Paul, in fact, prays that as Philemon does this, it would be effective in showing those around him everything that we receive in Christ. It shows us that Philemon's good nature was evident to all, and that the goodness he displayed in his life was viewed as a result of his faith in Jesus Christ. Philemon was exemplifying what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 21. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He closes this portion of the letter by letting Philemon know that not only does his good conduct bring glory and honor to God, but it has brought both joy and comfort to Paul. 
Again, toward the end of this letter, we learn that Philemon came to faith through the ministry of Paul. Therefore, Paul's joy in seeing Philemon grow into a faithful follower is quite understandable. It would be like a parent seeing their child develop and mature into an upstanding citizen uh, who are kind and generous to all, or a teacher uh, seeing their student apply all the lessons they had been taught, having gained a mastery of the subject. In a sense, Paul's joy and comfort is the return on his investment of love, grace, and teaching that he had poured into Philemon. And you know, although we should never be on the hunt for accolades or recognition, I think we can all acknowledge that it is a special blessing to receive them from others, isn't it? And especially when they come from those who mean a lot to us from those who are very important in our lives, like a parent or a coach or a teacher or a brother or sister in Christ that we look up to for their faith. To gain the approval of those we love often serves as a great source of encouragement. So within this mutual encouragement between Paul and Philemon, we're, we're learning more about Philemon's character and that he refreshed the hearts of the saints uh, in a similar way to what Paul was doing here to Philemon. Uh, Philemon had done to all the believers around him, so much so that word of his good character had traveled all the way to Rome, 2,000 kilometers away. Uh, imagine the character of a person here in St. Catharines being so genuine, being so good that they were spoken well of in Dallas, Texas. Uh, that's roughly the equivalent in distance. Uh, that was the situation that Paul had experienced. Paul was hearing in Rome of Philemon's good character. Uh, but let's consider this idea of being refreshed. The people that Philemon was refreshing the saints. Uh, the, the Greek word here indicates this idea of repose, uh, the ability to calm or to bring peace. Uh, even though times and cultures change, uh, people generally operate the same way as we always have. Uh, and just as we can feel stressed out or burdened by the trials of everyday life here in the 21st century, so did people in the first century. You could make the argument that for the first century believers, they had more reason for turmoil in their lives. Uh, think about this. We're reading a letter that was written by a man who was in prison uh, because he was a believer in sharing the gospel of Jesus. Uh, and there's evidence that worse things were happening to believers in this time. We don't face that as much in our society here. But Philemon had a special gift. Through the love of Christ that he showed to the believers around him, he was able to calm their hearts, give them rest from the turmoil and the stress that they encountered. And so the question to us is, have we ever met someone like that? Do we have a Philemon in our lives? Someone that when everything seems to be falling down around us, uh, doesn't necessarily make the trials go away, uh, but helps us to feel calm amidst the chaos. Have we ever tried to be that for someone else? It isn't easy. We will need God's help, um, but I believe that it starts with a desire to be that person, not for our own sake or our own popularity, but to bring glory and honor to Jesus through the way we live our lives, just like Philemon did. And if you do know someone like Philemon in your life, thank God for them. That's how Paul started this section. He thanked God for Philemon. I think this is one of the most important lessons from these, these few verses, uh, is being thankful for the godly people in our lives. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And it's easy to think of that first and reflect on these tangible things that, uh, that come into our lives, the provisions and, of resources to meet things that we need right now. And that's absolutely true. Uh, but remember, though, that God is our Father. And as our Father, He loves us and cares for us and wants what's best for us and makes sure we have everything we need. On top of that, he knows everything we need more so than we do. He can and does move people in and out of our lives uh, to provide challenge, conviction, encouragement, and refreshment that we need at any given time. Uh, so if that person is in your life right now, be thankful to God for them because that's, that's why they're there, uh, because he put them there. Uh, but you can also tell them how thankful you are for them. Uh, Chances are they're doing it because they're being led by the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case, you're not, they're not going to be puffed up. Uh, but God will receive the glory. And in that, we can all rejoice. 
Paul moves on to his request um, where he's, uh, he's asking for Philemon to receive back this slave Onesimus who had, who had run away from him. He starts with love. Um, again, remembering he's, he's introduced himself as just Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. He could have announced himself with his proper and usual authority as an apostle. Uh, he could have, uh, even outside of his apostolic ministry, he could have gone to the scriptures, he could have gone to the teachings of Christ and, and commanded that Philemon, on the basis of those things, receive Onesimus back. Paul knew that wasn't needed. He knew it wasn't necessary. Remember, Philemon is a good man. This is a good report that we get of Philemon. I don't believe that he needs convincing uh, he was clearly faithful to the teachings of Christ. Uh, so therefore, for Paul to assert his authority in a case like that uh, could even be seen as an indication that Paul thought he wouldn't, uh, that there was a chance that he would not respond in the way he should in Christ. And uh, it would have been contrary to everything that Paul had just said about Philemon. This request about Onesimus is, is, uh, is about a man who had been a slave to Philemon, uh, who had left him, he had run away. As to Onesimus' character, we know nothing about his life as Philemon's slave. We know nothing about his attitude, his level of service, his demeanor. Uh, we do know a lot about his life at the time of writing, um, even from just these few verses. To start, we can notice how Paul refers to him, my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. There are only three people in the Bible that Paul describes as his child, or Paul refers to as his child, Timothy, Titus, and Onesimus. Uh, it indicates a special bond that is formed, not just, not just that Paul had led them to the Lord. Uh, again, Philemon had become a believer directly through Paul's minister, yet Paul refers to him as my fellow worker. Um, and that's a, that's a good title as well, but it indicates that there's a much deeper connection here between Paul and Onesimus. If we look at the other two men that Paul uses this title with, uh, Timothy and Titus, uh, he's charging them with leading the church. He's charging them with uh, building it by training and establishing future leaders. I believe, as, as I read this and I see how Paul uh, refers to Onesimus, that uh, it's quite probable that Paul had a special task in mind for him. Uh, which is why he would say things like Onesimus was useful to him now and that he would be glad to keep him there in Rome. We also know that Onesimus' transformation in Christ was genuine. And I, I love this about him. When Paul appeals to Philemon in the same, in the same sentence, uh, he acknowledges that he was formerly useless, but now he is useful to both Philemon and to Paul. So much can be said about the changing power of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Many of us who have put our faith in him have experienced that firsthand, uh, both in, uh, in small ways, but also in great ways that when we look back at our lives to who we were and who we've become, we can say that is only possible through God. I would never have been able to change myself the way that I have been changed except for God. Romans 12 tells us to, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Uh, first, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Finally, Philippians 1.6 gives us the reminder that this process of change is brought on by God. It's ongoing and will be completed by God. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is confirming has taken place in Onesimus. Uh, and this is exciting. Uh, it, it's like the testimonies that we've been hearing as part of the Encounters series. Uh, Jesus Christ has changed Onesimus from what he was when he left to the man that's being sent back now. Paul doesn't disclose what made Onesimus useless to Philemon. It could have been that he had a rebellious spirit with no desire to be any man's slave. And that would certainly explain his unauthorized departure. Perhaps he had been mistreated. Uh, although this seems very unlikely given the glowing commendation that we've just heard of Philemon from Paul. But I don't want to move away from this idea too quickly. Uh, and I'm not saying that this was the case, but if we realize that mistreatment can fall into two categories, real and perceived, it may be possible that while Philemon and his household did not treat Onesimus poorly, 
that he may have felt left out or excluded on account of his not being a follower of Christ? Do we allow ourselves to become so isolated in our faith, uh, perhaps even prideful in our faith, that those who don't believe in Jesus feel uncomfortable around us or even unwanted? Is it possible that we are seen by those outside of the church as holier than thou or even judgmental? It's something to think about, and it provides another lesson for us that we should work and conduct ourselves in a way that makes us approachable, that makes people desire to have the peace that we have that comes through Christ, remembering that in doing so, we can't compromise our testimony. Uh, it isn't easy, and we need his grace. We need his guidance. Whatever the reason was that Onesimus had to leave, he found himself in Rome and uh, ended up crossing paths with Paul. And, and through that encounter, he came to know the Lord. Uh, and I suspect that Onesimus' heart was ready, maybe not when he left, but something along the way made him seek out Paul. Uh, remember that Paul is in prison at this time. He's in house arrest. Uh, the book of Acts tells us that he was permitted to have visitors and that he had many of them. And I can think of two reasons for Onesimus to visit Paul. One would be to appeal to him, calling out Philemon for his cruel treatment. Uh, and again, based on everything we've read, that isn't the case. It can't be the case. Philemon was too good-natured for that. In fact, I'm not even willing to exclude the possibility that Paul wrote such nice things about Philemon based on Onesimus' report to him. Because the other reason for Onesimus to seek out Paul would be due to a deep conviction that he had acted wrongly. He likely knew at least a little of Paul's relationship with Philemon and how it was Paul that was responsible for Philemon hearing the gospel and becoming a Christian. And this sticks with me. If Philemon's good conduct was, ma was modeled after Paul's, Onesimus would have every reason to believe that Paul would receive him with gentleness and love. Through this encounter with Paul, he puts his trust in, in Christ and he, he enters into service with Paul. Uh, and again, the details aren't sh no, made known to us about how Paul came to know that Onesimus was Philemon's servant. Maybe he knew it beforehand through his relationship with Philemon. Maybe it was revealed to him. But eventually it got to the point where Paul knew that Onesimus must be sent back. Now, for the sake of time, I, I won't get into... Um, the, un the discomfort that this verse causes with regards to the idea of slavery and, owner and slave ownership, but I will say this. We've looked at Philemon's character. It's a good character. There is absolutely no reason for Paul to suspect or anyone to suspect that Onesimus was being sent back into harm's way. Uh, we can read that verse uh, towards the end of his plea that Paul says, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. But I would be remiss if we looked at this passage and we didn't focus on the beautiful illustration of the gospel that we have here. Philemon is asked to receive Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as a beloved brother in Christ. Think, think about this for a minute. Philemon has been wronged. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that Onesimus had stolen from him or, or, or robbed him in any way, it's, uh, but he had been wronged. Here is his slave who is supposed to be obedient and who left. And that must have hurt. You know, we've probably all in our lives gone through rejection. Philemon was rejected. And now Paul is sending this man back with, with a request not just to receive him, but to forgive him and to view him as something different, something changed. You know, when we think of ourselves, we can, we can, think, of the, uh, we can think of the gospel that we've experienced. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have become enemies to God through our sin. Uh, Isaiah 59, it says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have, 
have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. He would say later in verse, uh, chapter 43 of verse 24, you have not bought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. And it gets worse from there. We get, we get to the New Testament and we, we read in Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages or penalty of sin is death. Speaking of that eternal separation from God. This is what we deserve. And when we get back to Onesimus, based on Roman law, this is what he deserved for his, his disobedience, his abandonment of his, his duties as a slave. For mankind, the fitting punishment for our rejection of God would be his rejection of us. And because of his perfect nature of justice, we would have no defense against his judgment of our sin. In the case of Onesimus, he receives an intercessor, an advocate to go before him to Philemon and plead for him. That, was, of course, was Paul, who had a pre-existing relationship of love with Philemon. And to make this illustration more complete, he says in the letter, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I will repay it. And again, typically we understand that Paul is talking about financial loss here or tangible loss, but uh, the reality is, is that Onesimus had wronged Philemon. He had rejected him and left. And Paul is now stepping in the middle and declaring to Philemon that anything Onesimus has done against him, he will be sure to restore it to Philemon. We have an intercessor too. Romans 5.8 tells us that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In 2 Peter, or 1 Peter 2.24, we read, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. When we look at Onesimus, it wasn't a slave coming back. It was a brother. He was changed. When we look at ourselves in Christ, we're not just former enemies returning to God. We are received as children, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Now, if this was the only uh, lesson that we had in this portion of, of Philemon where Onesimus is being sent back, this illustration of the gospel, we would be most blessed. <laughs> but there's more. It's sometimes overlooked. Uh, and this goes back to the idea of the church as a family. But what is Paul demonstrating here for us is uh, it's another principle of, for life in the family of God. In our local church family, and again, we are a family, it's the principle of intercession. Most of the time when we consider intercession from a believer's standpoint, it involves prayer. We pray, we pray to God uh, to intercede. Uh, we see countless examples of this in the life of Moses, praying intercession to God for the people of Israel. And God would, uh, Moses would step in and, and, and intercede. Uh, but this is important, and, and we should pray for others like that. But Paul is demonstrating a practical form of intercession. He sees an opportunity for strife to enter into a local church, even a family of believers. And, though, uh, and, and through this potential tension could, you know, it, caused by this debt, it could cause division. Psalm 133 begins with the words, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. And Paul wants to do everything he can to maintain this unity, both in the Colossian church and in the house of Philemon. He doesn't want to see some worldly obstacles grow into something that can cause division or turmoil. He doesn't want to give Satan an open door. And so he agrees to step in, even at a cost to himself. Over the centuries, the church has suffered through countless divisions. Many of those are based on doctrinal issues, and uh, perhaps this, this kind of intercession wouldn't apply there. But sadly, many divisions have occurred over carnal issues, uh, where people in the church took sides and joined the fight, rather than interceding practically to settle the dispute and maintain love and unity among the body of Christ. I understand that not every dispute can be settled in the same way that Paul is doing here, but the underlying principle is that we need to be doing everything we possibly can when these disputes arise, when these strifes and divisions creep in, uh, to stop them and not let them grow and fester into a situation where reconciliation becomes impossible. We need to always remember that the strength of any family is the bond of love that exists between every member. 
And if we let that bond break or sever, it makes us a weaker church. And we will significantly impair our ability to serve and glorify God effectively. Paul closes this section saying that, again, he is confident that Philemon will do everything he asks and even more. And this is the exact same promise we have from God. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. There are no maybes about it. Uh, We can be confident that when we turn to Christ as our Savior, uh, our Lord, our intercessor, that God will not only forgive us and save us from our sin, he won't only receive us as his own children, and again, this is all amazing things, but he will bless us far more than we can ever imagine. In closing, I'd like to look at the last few verses. I won't take the time to read them again, uh, but again, this is, this is one of those things that sometimes we can skim over, and it's, it's the portion of the greetings, those people that are with Paul, uh, in this case, Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. Timothy was mentioned at the start of this letter. Um, thinking about these verses really hits home for me uh, because I'm often guilty of this and I'm often like this, but when we are considering the work of the Lord in any capacity, we can't do it alone. Paul, perhaps the greatest Christian to ever live, had all these people surrounding him, helping him in his ministry. We need help. Sometimes that means breaking down and asking for it, and I'll be the first to admit that that's not my strong suit. But it also means being ready and available to help others when they need it, whenever we can. Because the reality, of it is, the reality is, is, if we're working for the Lord, it's not my work. It's not your work. It's the Lord's work. And we're all part of that together. And that's why these lessons from Philemon about uh, being members of a church, being members of the family of God, and the way we interact with one another and those around us in the world are so important. Because if we're not building each other up in the church, no one will be. And we can't build each other up except through the spirit that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's thank him for that. And let's ask him to equip us to build one another up. Father, Father, we thank you that we call you Father. Uh, we might think we have no business calling the creator of the universe our Father, but you have made that possible through your Son, through his death and resurrection, through, our, through faith in him, you have saved us and made us your children. Father, help us to take that position seriously. Help us to love one another with the same love that you have loved us with knowing that uh, as we build each other up and as we do your work here on earth, you receive glory and you receive honor. Father, we recognize how difficult it is. We recognize the, the fight that we have with the flesh on a daily basis. Help us to overcome through Christ. Help us to be a family here on earth that presents your son faithfully and truthfully and makes him known and shines your light that all may see that you are God, and you are God alone. We ask this in Jesus' precious name.